Well, hello, New Life Church. It's Mike Gore here from Open Doors, and we're doing church a little bit differently these days. So I think last year when I was with you, I got to do what was called maybe the chicken run or something like that. Anyway, four services across two different cities all over the place, up, down, in, out, backwards. Well, this time, I get to do it from the comfort of a lounge. And my hope is today that we get to uh, work together, learn together, and really just push into faith and, and what faith means for us living in society and culture today. Before we get to that, I want to say a huge thank you uh, for partnering with Open Doors and for all the support you've given North Korean believers. Um, you've provided food, shelter, training. North Korea is still the most difficult place on earth to be a Christian. And Stu Cameron and all of your investment into the work we're doing in that nation, it will have a profound impact on the future of faith for Christians in that nation. And so from all of us here at Open Doors to you, a huge Thank you, because so often Christians are not the ones that people really care about growing and investing in. We love the idea of social justice and all these things, but we're not necessarily committed to the survival of the church. And your investment, your sacrifice, is ensuring a future of faith in a nation that is one of the most closed on the planet. So a huge thank you to Stu, all the team watching this. Uh, We just appreciate you guys so much. One of the things I've always loved about Open Doors and in my conversations um, with Stu are the lessons and the kind of, I don't know, the tips and the tricks that you can kind of grab from the persecuted church. What's really interesting, though, is when I look around society and culture, even the very fact that I'm giving you this talk from the living room tells me that the church is changing in Australia. In fact, what we're seeing is a move towards a church model that is far more in line with, I guess, what we're comfortable with at Open Doors. For 65 years, we've been working with churches that are forced into houses, into caves, or in a decentralized format. And as hopefully an encouragement to you guys, there are two things that we see happen when the church is forced into homes. Number one is that we see the power shift downwards. In fact, people become leaders overnight who have never been leaders. You inherit one of the biggest, or sort of say, a micro church on the planet. You become pastors of your own family, friends, friendship circles. And as Australia sort of does everything it can to stave off the advancement of COVID-19, it really will be a case of being coming pastors to our own families. So number one, power will shift downwards into houses and churches, and people will find themselves in leadership roles that never had them before. But the second thing that happens is that the gospel often reaches out. Because neighborhoods, cities, communities, they find themselves with churches having never had one before because houses have become churches. You know, we so learned so much of this from China in the 50s and the 60s where, again, at the height of persecution, the church as we know, that centralized kind of format of church, it was split up and the church fractured and was forced into homes. And overnight again, people became leaders who had never been leaders, preachers who had never been preachers. But similarly, it was a catalyst to one of the greatest revivals the world has ever seen. Because as churches reached into community, particularly under communism at that stage, people were looking for belonging. They're looking for connection. They're looking for God. In fact, it's what I'd call the great divergence in moments of crisis. What I see happen around the world, having worked with a church under crisis for the last 65 years as a ministry, the great divergence in Western nations is that in moments of crisis, like COVID-19, we can often see established Christians grow cold and question the existence of God. Whereas we find people who don't know God become lonely and question the existence of God, but they go looking for him. And if we're not careful, the great divergence begins. Established Christians questioning, God, where are you? Non-Christians going, God, I need you. Our job as believers and even people, even people watching this today is how can we stop it from diverging and realize that maybe, just maybe, this is one of the greatest opportunities to share Jesus with your community online, in your neighborhood, that we've ever had. The message of Jesus is not changing, but the method of delivery is. And so my hope is that's an encouragement to you as we get started today, that faith is exciting. We're not on the back foot. We're not 
downtrodden. God's using this, and he can use it to build his church. In the moments of crisis and pressure, there is always opportunity to talk about Jesus. And so today, I want to talk to us about sacrifice. In fact, before we get started, I thought we should read from the scriptures. And so if you're watching along today, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 29. So I've got my NLT Bible here with me and my notes. Um, turn with me now to 2 Corinthians Chapter 11, starting at verse 23, and we'll read through to verse 29. Written by Paul, a book that I love. Paul himself, I think, is such an incredible um, example of a guy who personally, as far as we know, never met Jesus face to face. I mean, he was alive at the same time, but never actually interacted with him, which makes him a lot like you and I. Never met him personally, but does passionately follow him. That's why I love his writings, because they're so detailed and so intimate, and it leaves me questioning often, and does Paul know a different version of Jesus to me? But that's the beauty of the scriptures, is that we have this wonderful chance to get a deep insight from a guy who is so similar to you and I in his exposure to Jesus. And so he writes here, starting at verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold, without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all of this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray, and I did not burn with anger. I said before, today I want to talk about sacrifice. It's a faith that involves giving up something of value. It could be safety, comforts, rights, health, well-being even. All for the sake of Jesus. In many ways, sacrifice is a foundation to faith. In Romans 8.28, we read, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It's one of those famous verses from the Bible that, if you're like me, it kind of helped form an idea of what I'd signed up to when I agreed to follow this guy called Jesus. It's almost as though we have a habit or a tendency to build a contract of faith between ourselves and God. It's based off several of the, the positive and the uplifting verses we read in the Bible. But for me, it was a journey that, that I took the year that I became CEO of Open Doors. It changed all of that for me. I thought the year that I stepped into the role of CEO for Open Doors would be one of those kind of heaven's opening, angels singing kind of years. I mean, from the day it started, you know, I would have these great spiritual disciplines in place, be strong in leadership, really driving the place forward, and just, man, God would be happy with me. Well, I remember on January 1, that the morning that I was officially the CEO, I was holidaying with my family in Coffs Harbour on the northern New South Wales coast, a beautiful part of the world. And I'm sure actually many of you watching Emerald Beach, Caravan Park, that's where we'd go every year in a beautiful part of the world that I loved. But January 1 comes. New Year's Eve's been. January 1's here. We wake up and my wife, my two daughters and me, we all have gastro. In fact, over the next couple of weeks, I lost 10 kilos from that bout of gastro. In February, only a month later, I lost $30,000 personally from a small business I had when we were victim of a credit card fraud scheme that one of our staff had actually fallen victim to. Then in November of that year, I was diagnosed with parathyroid disease. They thought it was cancer. I was rushed into hospital to have surgery. The day after surgery, I suffered a bulging disc in my back and was bedridden for another two weeks on top of that. The year also had consistently significant health issues in our immediate family, but also 
consistently big issues in my wider family, marriage breakdowns and all sorts of really, really difficult things to walk through. But you know what made all of it worse? It was this self-expectation that I had of Jesus, to be honest. Because my contract with him, it had him conform to being what can only be described as a mix of Superman and Santa Claus. Essentially, this unseen vending machine in the sky where it's as though I say, I do my best to live a Christian life and in return, he will provide me with safe passage and all of the good things I've ever wanted. I know it, it sounds crass. It may even sound over the top. But I promise you it's the truth. It's absolutely how my faith worked. The longer you and I, the longer we measure our proximity to God based off his provision of safety, the faster our fall to a doubt-riddled faith is. I'm going to say that again. Think about it. The, the longer you and I measure our closeness, our proximity, our connectedness to God of his provision of safety, well, it's the faster our fall to a doubt-riddled faith is. So let me ask you, is this how your faith works too? I've spent years thinking, and in some cases being told, that verses like Romans 8.28, they tell me that because I'm a follower of Jesus, life should be full of good things, because after all, he wants good for me. But in my time working with Open Doors, I've met people who they almost have the exact opposite experience to that. Life isn't easy. Life isn't good. But their connectedness, their relationship with God, it is close, it is intimate, and it is beautiful. It reminds me of a time, one of my first trips with the ministry, smuggling Bibles, something that Open Doors has been known of for, for such a long time and for so many people I guess smuggling Bibles on the notion of that is something that's alluring and exciting. But I remember for me, it was just terrifying. Uh, we were in China and getting ready to smuggle Bibles into mainland China. We're in Hong Kong, meeting in the mountains outside of Hong Kong. And on this occasion, I had 17 kilos of Bibles getting ready to smuggle them in. And as we met with the underground church, we were talking about what the next day might look like, what would happen if we were caught, how we'd get them across the border, all of these kind of interesting things around the mechanics of making the drop. Anyway, as we're talking, one of the brothers said, look, last time we had a group of travellers there at the Hong Kong border. We were standing there waiting to get our Bibles through, and we said, let's just pray that we can get these Bibles through. And the brother said, as we prayed, the x-ray machines, they just blew up and caught on fire. I mean, there was smoke, there was flames, everything. And he says, we were able to just get the Bibles through. And so we're sitting there, and he says, oh, I think we should pray the same thing will happen again. I remember thinking to myself, hang on, I'm going to pray out loud that an x-ray machine would blow up and catch on fire? This has got to be one of the craziest, strangest things I've ever been asked to do. And so anyway, we sat there and I half-heartedly, to be honest, prayed a prayer. It was like, Father, oh man, we need to get these Bibles through. And I pray that you would just make these x-ray machines blow up and catch on fire. And Anyway, amen. Go to sleep, wake up, and just see what happens. As we're getting ready to go on the bus the next day down to the board, we have all our bags packed, and this brother from the night before comes running out with his big smile on his face, waving a piece of paper. He jumps on the bus, and he starts to read it out, and he said it was a news report from a local website. Last night at 8 o'clock, the time he'd been praying, the X-ray machines at the Hong Kong border blew up and caught on fire, and they would be down for today. And surely enough, as we got down to the border... Here they are, scorch marks, yellow tape, sort of marking them off. Only certain bags were being selected at random, and we were able to get our Bibles through and into China. But the part of the story that I want to focus on and share with you today was what happened after that. Because I remember sitting with a guy, 60, 70, maybe even 80 years old, from the underground church in China. We talked about life, faith, uh, in the face of communism, and all of the wrestles and sacrifices and challenges that he had had to make. And at the end of that conversation, I sort of said to him, look, well, brother, can I pray for you? And he looked at me and says, yeah, I want you to pray that persecution never leaves China. 
I thought to myself, That's, that can't be right. I work for a charity. I thought our job was to end stuff. But, and as I spoke to him, he said, well, well, we look at the Australian church as a prophetic example of what happens when faith becomes free. He said the value of Jesus drops. I want you to pray that persecution will never leave China. And then naively, I look at him and said, well, brother, can you pray for me? And he says, yeah, I pray you'll be persecuted. It reminded me so much of another, I guess, pearl of wisdom from the underground church in China where a brother called Li Chin said, well, persecution is the enemy's second best tactic. His best is materialism. Li Chin said, picture this, the enemy, the devil, that has a barrel of a gun pressed towards your temple, and he says, renounce Christ or I'll pull the trigger. Li Chin said, nine times out of ten, in that moment, we'll find the courage not to deny Christ and the trigger will be pulled. But he said, now picture this, Mike. The enemy says, well, fine, you can have it all. Here it is. He takes you to a warehouse. It's big. It's beautiful. It's bold. He says, you have that house, money, cars, food, chocolate, whatever it is you love. And he said, and you can also have Jesus. There he is, sitting on a throne. You can go to him any time you want. Li Chin said to us, it's not too long before you get so focused on playing in the blessings that you don't even realize that Jesus Christ has left the building. He says, that's the challenge with materialism. Because I've seen a lot of people survive persecution, but very few prosperity. It got me thinking, I mean, which is a greater danger to your faith, ISIS or an iPhone? If we think back over the war with the, in the Middle East, in Syria and Iraq, for the last 10 or 11 years, we've, been, we've seen one of those drive people to God. But when I think about my own life, I've seen one of them draw them away from him. And it's a subtlety of distraction that seems to suffocate our faith, whereas the pressure of persecution, it brings faith to life. The pressure of sacrifice, it brings faith to life. Which is a greater danger to your faith, ISIS or an iPhone? As I let my mind think back to Romans 8.28, I realized that if I'm honest, I was missing one crucial part with that verse. Because it says, God works all things for the good of those who love him, not all good things for the good of those who love him. It means that God uses the good things and the bad things, the times of harvest and the moments of arid dryness and sacrifice in our lives for good. Looking back, I actually see that some of the greatest times of growth in my leadership, my faith, they actually came from the moments of sacrifice. The moments of testing, and I promise you it's had great ramifications on my faith walk, my leadership, and even my marriage. So how has persecution and sacrifice shaped faith historically? And more than that, how does it still shape faith today? A good friend of mine, Nick Ripken, wrote a book called The Insanity of God, and he says the following, I'm not sure if I've ever heard it said out loud, but I also picked up the idea that obedience to God's call would result in a life of safety and security. Sounds familiar, right? Obedience, it was implied, would lead to effective ministry and measurable results and even success. The safest place to be, I was told, more than once is right in the center of God's will. And Nick said that sounded both true and reassuring. I admit, however, my surprise, he says, many years later, when I found myself living a life that was neither safe nor secure. I was stunned when, despite what I considered to be a life of sacrificial obedience, I could not point to anything in my ministry that was really effective. There were simply no results to measure, and success, he said, was not a word that I would ever have used to describe the ministry he was in. Nick says, it might in fact be safe to be at the center of God's will, but we would be wise to stop and think about what it means to be safe. He said, I felt that I'd lived a life in response to the call of God, and instead of effective ministry, measurable results, and what might pass for success, he said, I felt mostly loss and heartache and failure. The thing is that unless we wrestle with these ideas or address them head on, they can lead easily to a crisis of faith where we begin asking questions like, well, does God in fact promise safety? Do things always work out for those who are obedient? 
Is it possible to love God and pretty much keep living the life I've been living? Or would God really allow people who love him to fail? What's funny is they sound like big questions, deep questions, but really they're not because the Bible's pretty clear on the cost of faith in Jesus. In our readings today, we heard about Paul talking about the fact that he had um, been in pursuit of Jesus in his relationship with him, and because of that, he's been lashed, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked. He's been hungry, thirsty. He's had all sorts of health problems, friendships, the relationship breakdowns. He's been abused, criminals attacking him, and on top of all of that, he says he's got a burden for the church. And that, as Nick said above, after a lifetime of ministry, left him feeling mainly lost, heartache, and failure. But what I love about this passage is that he goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8, the three different times I begged the Lord to take it away, and each time he said, my grace is sufficient for me. My power works best in weakness, so now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I don't know how many times I've also responded like this, Lord, help me. But God simply says, my grace is all you need. I want to have a really quick look today at the role sacrifices played in, in both the church, but also the lives of individuals. And if we start by looking at the church, a quick look of Acts is a pretty good start. In Acts 1, you have the ascension of Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes. Acts 2, believe is a form of community, essentially the birth of the church. Acts 3, miracles and preaching. Acts 4, opposition comes. This is where the cost of faith is realized. Believers pray for courage, more healing, more miracles. Acts 5, more opposition. Acts 6, words begin to damage. Later in Acts 6, we have Stephen standing up, taking on opposition, and ultimately being killed for his faith. In Acts 8, persecution and sacrifice, it scatters the believers. Acts 11, the gospel spreads and the Great Commission begins. Have you ever realized that Persecution, it allows the gospel to go to places it otherwise never would have reached. In fact, God used Saul to build the church as well as Paul. Had Saul not persecuted believers, the gospel would never have left Jerusalem. But the most beautiful thing in God's infinite wisdom and grace, he converts Paul, Saul, and turns him into one of the greatest evangelists the world has ever known. So it seems as though the model initially looked or sounded something like this. Great Commission, comfort, that's what we do, persecution, and action. But when Saul began persecuting believers, it seemed to change to this. Great Commission, persecution, sacrifice, action. We'll jump forward 2,000 years and are the same thing still at play? Are people still giving up everything in pursuit of Jesus? There's a country called Eritrea and a person that we know called Elihu. He worked for the military but was arrested when he was having a church service, which is illegal in that country. They held him three years without charge. In fact, in that country, they will often excavate a cell under the surface of the earth. They dig about a 70 centimeter wide hole in the surface of the earth. They excavate a cell underneath the ground. They force you down that hole and that is your cell. Elihu was in prison there for three years underground. He used to write scriptures or song lyrics and sing songs as a way of keeping himself sane in that time. On one occasion, as a form of torture and punishment, they shackled his arms and legs and they left him what he called topside for 30 days. He said the, uh, the ground was like an oven. But what they did was they made him lay on his back and forced him to look at the sun. Between midday and 1 p.m. every day, the soldiers would force him to have his eyes open staring at the sun. After that, they dug a hole 70 centimetres wide and 5 feet deep. They took Elihu. He was all but blind now. They forced him to stand in that hole. They left him there standing for five months. Five months. 
he could no longer stand when they pulled him out and ultimately, after he finally was released and escaped, Open Doors bumped into him and was talking to him. They asked him a fairly direct question. I'm not sure I would have asked it, to tell you the truth. But they said to Elihu, what would you say to your captors? And I want to read you his response. He said, I would say to them, well, it's easy to sign a piece of paper and free yourself. What they wanted him to do was sign a piece of paper saying that he would not be a Christian and wouldn't share the gospel. If he did that, they would have released him. He wouldn't have had to be topside standing in a whole prison underground. But he, but he never signed it. He said, I'd say it's easy to sign a piece of paper and free yourself, but what's the meaning of following Jesus Christ? You cannot just follow him in the peaceful and good times. You have to follow him in difficult and hard times too. There were times in the Bible when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego could have just kneeled. But they had a Lord to follow. They did not submit to Nebuchadnezzar, who told them to renounce their faith. They could have just obeyed and left without any problems, but they'd gone all the way through the problems and sufferings. God never abandoned them. I love this. Elihu says, Jesus Christ died and suffered for us. So why should I not do the same for him? Following Jesus, it comes with sacrifice. It requires obedience, trust, and an assurance that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. I'm not saying you're not allowed good things when following Jesus. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that we're called to be bold, courageous, and committed above all things. Jesus is not a mix between Superman and Santa Claus, and by following him, we don't get a life full of blessing and fruit. We get a great commission that involves sacrifice, hardship, and a call to shine as brightly for him as we can. Sometimes the story, it doesn't end, doesn't even start sometimes the way we want it to. But ultimately, God is always faithful. So let me leave you with this question. If more of God meant less of the world, would you still wake up with the same passion for him? New Life Church, it has been a great privilege to be with you today as we see the church shift and change and look different in our country. I want to encourage you. Hold on to all things loosely except Jesus. Because the reality is, the message of Jesus is not changing. The method of delivery is. We've got this. And more than that, he's got us. God bless. <laughs>